Hello, Marie. How are you? I'm very good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, and I'm very, very excited to meet you. Um, finally, um, you? you. I'm uh, honestly very honored to have you as my guest. You are. Um, I mean, I. I don't think anyone will argue with me if I say you're Canada's best criminal defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's very nice to see you. And I'm even more proud of you because we come from the same background. We're both Middle Eastern. And yeah. this is something that maybe I would like to start talking about. It's sure. the culture and our background because uh, we do come from a very hot region, mm. uh, politically speaking, a lot of debates. We all grow up in households where there's a lot of political debates in the family dinners and gatherings. And I think that it does have a profound impact on us and it shapes the way we think, our personalities and our character. And you do actually talk about that a bit in your book. Right. Uh, and I will say that your book, Nothing But The Truth, is actually a really good book. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. And I would like to hear a bit more about you, uh, from you about uh, the culture and its impact on us and even as lawyers. Sure. I mean, well, first of all, the, the culture is a, a very significant impact on me personally. Um, as an immigrant, it obviously um, affects very much of your feeling about your place in society and, and how you fit in to uh, a, a very different culture, particularly as a new immigrant, when you are brought up with a culture that doesn't resonate um, mm -hmm. with North American culture. And so you sort of feel a bit conflicted. I think what was interesting to me is that when I wrote the book, you know, where, when I started it and where I ended, the, the most surprising revelation to me was how impactful that was in my life and how it continues to be. Uh, a thing that is uh, very relevant to me when you're an immigrant and you're not white, uh, how it, it's something that uh, you sort of never get over. It, it really um, is always uh, a part of you. And that was a surprise to me. That was a surprise that, you know, when I got to talking about what it felt like when I was 15, my experiences about wanting to uh, belong, that's, that's what emerged for me was that it was just still this, um, this factor that was very significant. Um, but it, as much as it was uh, and is significant to me, there were numerous positive impacts. I mean, it formed me, our culture, uh, you know, Mediterranean cultures, Middle Eastern mm -hmm. cultures are, are very strong and, and very uh, specific in their, their approach. And so <laughs> it impacted me very much. I, I, I can't say any different. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up in an unusually matriarchal household uh, with very, very strong women. I, I come from a, a line of unusually strong women, you know, on my, on my father's side, um, you know, a generation or two before in the Middle East, um, there were women that were supporting their families, which is unheard of uh, in, in the Middle East at that time. So, I just come from an unusually matriarchal family and that was obviously very significant to me. And then the other thing you talked about, which is, you know, in our culture, you, you can't have dinner without argument. Yes. The argument doesn't mean you don't love each other or that it's personal. Exactly. That's, that's how we talk, right? It's there's very, passion. very different. It's very passionate. Of, as well. For sure. Yeah. A lot of passion. <laughs> and so, you know, having an argument with somebody, a, a yeah. political argument or argument yeah. about anything, uh, which is every conversation, by the way. Yeah doesn't mean you don't have affection for each other or that you will stop talking. You then go and dance and you forget about it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, you know, that's also, I think, part of what you bring to the practice of law that, you know, you can have these very uh, strong disagreements and fights in court, but outside you can be friends with your colleagues. It, it's, yeah. it doesn't reflect, it doesn't mean you don't like them or you don't respect them. Yeah. You know, this is over here. That's just how we have to communicate. Yeah. And outside is is quite different. So you know, I think that that also has a bit of an impact in terms of what your approach is to to our practice. And also, I find because we're all constantly growing up in debates, so we right away we kind of like cross examination is also part of our culture. Like our parents sure. are constantly cross examining oh, us. You have to come up with creative sure. ways to find answers and to escape, you know, answering questions. Yeah, it's true. It's so it's true. A good. 
it's like a bar school, pre bar school. <laughs> it's true. It is. It is very true. Prepares you definitely. Okay, but um, but speaking about because you did bring up uh, the uh, subject of uh, growing up in a very matriarchal <laughs> household. So, um, I mean, you you had strong females uh in the family that probably were that shaped you i mean i know in your book you were talking about your mm -hmm. grandmother teta mm -hmm. uh with whom you were very close um but if we want to shift and get this into law now and the role of the female uh criminal defense lawyer because we are seeing more obviously there are more female defense lawyers now in practice but i mean it doesn't look like there is full equality or that they have the same advantages as their male counterparts. So Marie, because you're a very successful right. criminal uh, defense lawyer, but you are also a female criminal defense lawyer. So I wanted to hear, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about the role of the criminal defense lawyer and what should women do to improve the situation of the female criminal defense lawyer? Well, I, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes the statistics are misleading. So we see that in law schools, for example, 50% uh, and sometimes more than 50% of the student body are female. Mm -hmm. And then the statistic that does not seem to have been significantly impacted is as you get into the upper years where you're talking about uh, senior lawyers and lawyers that are partners or namesakes of firms that the numbers drop very, very dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we see, particularly uh, in the criminal bar, is that uh, a lot of women, certainly we are well represented on the bench, uh, although, uh, you know, we've not had a, a female chief justice of Ontario. We've had, you know, one female chief justice in the Supreme Court. Uh, but you do see more representation uh, on the court. Uh, and you do see representation in the Crown's office, certainly senior Crown yeah. attorneys that are female, which is great to see. Uh, but you do not see senior uh, female defense lawyers. Mm -hmm. And there are a, a couple of reasons, I think, for that. I, I think about it a great deal, to be honest, because it's something that frustrates me um, extensively and, and something that uh, I think really needs to change. One is that in the practice of defense work, you run your own business. So it yeah. is, as much as it is a practice, it is a profession, it's also a business. And that brings with it all sorts of challenges. Now, women are and can be profoundly successful business people, but there is that added pressure uh, of having to run your own business, which I think uh, can be challenging. But I, I don't think that's really the driver. I don't think that is why women leave the profession. Uh, I think what happens is that as you continue in this profession and as you stick in it, uh, you see that, you know, you, you cracking certain types of work and uh, certain echelons become more and more and more difficult. And so it becomes disheartening when you can't see the promotion, when you can't see the, the access, when you don't see the visibility of, of senior women. And, you know, everybody's happy to invite you into their club to a point, but they don't want to give up their seat. Mm -hmm. And in order for there to be equality and parity, you have to give up some of, your, some of the seat. Right. And that's when it becomes very uncomfortable. Uh, so I, I think I think women are, are welcomed into the profession to a point. I, I think yeah. we're allowed to have a certain amount of success, but too much becomes a little unacceptable and, and unpleasant and uh, not something that's, that's willingly handed over. And I have to say, because it's important for us to know this, that when you look at women in the profession across the board, I'm talking about other areas of practice, because we women in the defense bar are not alone in this struggle, you will see the same pattern repeating. If you are on a Bay Street firm, in a Bay Street firm, you will see that when you get up to the higher levels of, of practice, uh, women are pushed out, women struggle, women are not given the access that they need to have to um, develop a client base, which is critical to your success in, in those firms. And you see the same pattern repeating itself. And so, uh, that is one of the fundamental problems. It's not as it's not that we're not ambitious or as ambitious, and certainly not as talented. We are as talented, if not more so. Uh, the problem is this really lack of the, this 
you know, you go back to the glass ceiling. There is a glass but, but do you think that they are perceived as threats by males? That women in the profession are yeah. perceived as, uh, I think. If we, they become very powerful or uh, if they become. I think we are perceived as threats when we start competing for the same type of work. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Particularly when it becomes more and more rarefied, more and more difficult to access. Uh, so, you know, do, is somebody going to care that we're doing a theft under? Probably not. Is somebody gonna <laughs> doing an assault? Probably, but keep going up the list. Yeah. And then we will see that, uh, you know, somebody looks at you and says, well, hold on a second. I, I would like that case or you're, you're cutting my grass. And that's, that's what I'm talking about is that the push in the profession. And uh, again, we should not just focus on criminal defense yeah. lawyers. Uh, because I want you to know, anybody who's watching this, that, that women across the profession are feeling the same pressures we're feeling, is that once it comes to getting those clients, you know, getting those big cases, getting, getting a piece of the pie, uh, you see a lot of resistance. And then you see a lot of frustration and a lot of women saying, all right, well, you don't want me here. You're pushing me out because you're not, you don't like me playing on the same on the same uh, playing field and so it becomes demoralizing and it becomes frustrating and I can tell you that I, I've been at this for over three decades and I would probably say the last decade and a bit have been the most frustrating for me on a personal level because of that um, very evident uh, a feeling and so that's me at three decades. So when you're young and you and you're feeling that it, you know the more you go along the more you're not, feeling rewarded and accepted and treated as, as being on even keel, um, the more you start thinking of other options, right? Then you start saying, well, it's not, uh, why? It's a tough business to begin with. Why am I putting myself through this? Right. I'll go to the bench. I will go into the Crown's office. I'll become in-house counsel. I will do other things that where I'm appreciated, where my value is acknowledged and it is not such a struggle. So, you know, the one message I hope that women are, are going to take from this is to stick with it, like stay for the long haul. And I know it gets tougher and tougher, but it's important that we're here. It's important that we, we get to the finish line. Yes. Have you had moments where you thought about other options, Marie? Uh, no, because I like going places I'm not supposed to go. And it's my maybe my Middle Eastern confrontational personality. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to have people tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing and, and where and I you'll am. do the opposite anyways, right? Like if I'll do what I want. Yeah. I'll do what yeah. I want. I'll do what I think I'm, I can do. And often I will challenge myself to, um, to do things that are, are, you know, more difficult or people wouldn't assume I'd be able to do. That just is something that interests me and, 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 drives me but no I'm not going to ever listen to where people think I belong in not in a million years I, I just I have no interest in that okay and uh because you did say that I mean your advice to women is to just keep on doing it and not to basically give up uh even if you're getting resistance or you're feeling that resistance uh but it is difficult though. Like I saw, so what I'm interested in knowing is what do you do when you are, because it's hard, it's psychological. It's a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to keep on doing what you want to do and to uh, keep the noise away. But how do you ultimately cope with that? Well, I, you know, I, for me personally, there yeah. have been a couple of sources of that. You know, one source of, uh, strength have been my female colleagues who are not necessarily criminal defense lawyers, but uh, again, uh, across the profession, uh, whether they're crown attorneys or other areas of practice that uh, experience similar things. And, and that, that um, support uh, network uh, feeds my soul in the way that it needs to be, you know, fed, which is uh, a lot of camaraderie and knowing that they have your back. Uh, it, it's very important. You know, the support from surprisingly uh, older male colleagues that are probably a generation uh, above me um, has been very helpful. And so there, there are people that are have been more experienced at the bar than me that have throughout my life been uh, supportive, which is a, a surprising source. It's always surprised me that that's 
where you would get that support, but uh, they've been encouraging and, and very helpful and um, people that I've, I've, I've looked to. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, because we are in a profession that it's a bit of a solo enterprise, you have to look to yourself, right? You have to be uh, confident in your assessment of what you think you can and cannot do. And as you said, to use your words, you do have to shut down the noise because as women uh, in particular, uh, we are constantly told how we need to look, how we need to behave, how we need to, to speak, all and, and none of it is consistent, right? Everybody has a very different opinion about what's appropriate and what's not. And if you begin to listen to it, you just get confused and, and you're never going to meet those expectations. So, you know, I, I, I think you have to also really, really uh, focus on, on listening to yourself. And um, how do you see female uh, defense lawyers are with each other in the profession? Supportive. Uh, I think female defense lawyers are supportive. And I, I think we um, have not historically been very good at business development, but there's been more of that recently. You know, there's refer to her and those sorts of things where there's a concerted effort to, um, to interact also on a business level. And I think we're getting better at that. And I think we're focusing our energies. You know, I, I always say I'm so sick of these work-life balance, con you know, conferences, give them to a, to the men. Now, they seem to know uh, that they need it uh, to assist. But, you know, for us, we also need business development, you know, networking conferences. And it's really great to see, including at the CLA, uh, that women are beginning to focus on this and, mm -hmm. and beginning to look to each other uh, for that type of, of support network. Again, just going to other areas, where you really see it is that uh, a lot of the in-house counsel or the general counsel are women now. And so they're the ones who are giving out the work that's corporate work and, and civil work. And a lot of the firms don't know what to do with that because all of a sudden you're not going to take the GC who happens to be a female out to necessarily, I mean, some people like it, but you know, a hockey game for a beer, right. Or you're yeah. not going to go to a bar. You're not going to, make your connections that way anymore and so those places are struggling because all of a sudden the complexion of who's in charge who's giving out the work is changing so i think we're getting better at at recognizing that we're in it we're here and that um the networking piece is very important for us okay and uh, so we did talk about the role or the situation of female uh, criminal defense lawyers but criminal uh, defense lawyers in general. I mean, whether it's males or females, there is a problem right now, whether it's the funding or whether it's uh, Crown's recruiting a lot of uh, um, defense lawyers. Um, the problem is maybe money uh, in many situations, but it's also the type of work, the difficulty, although it's very interesting. I find when uh, doing work from a defense perspective is a lot more interesting, I find, than doing Crown work. And it's sad to see that a lot of people who start going into this profession, they have passion, but it goes away. And I just feel like there's a bit of a crisis in the criminal defense bar itself. Um, but what do you think can, or is there anything that we can do? Or what are your thoughts about that? The, the funding has always been a problem. I mean, this is yes. not, not a new event. It continues to be a problem. And the difficulty is that when you're publicly funded, when the choice is put money towards schools, put money towards healthcare, or put money towards people charged with crime to let them get their counsel, you know that yeah. a politician is going to make the decision to put it towards school funding or, or funding for health. It's very difficult to make this a publicly valuable uh, resource. And, and people never know how important it is until they're criminally charged, until yeah they're up against the government and they all of a sudden realize the extraordinary limitless resources that the government has compared to an individual. And so I think that the public doesn't really necessarily see this as a value, but I don't blame them because we need to explain it, but the politicians certainly don't get any political capital. And the only way that you would ever increase that sort of funding, and it does happen, you know, sporadically, is to recognize that our justice system is very much 
a core component of our democracy. And, and when you look at the types of things that members of the public litigate in criminal cases and in, in other types of cases, it is so fundamental to the way we function every single day. I, I think if we put the value on the system uh, as being so integral to our democracy, uh, I think we might find a, a more, um, a, an easier path to explaining why the funding of the defense bar is so critical because you need an independent defense bar just like you need a strong prosecution bar. And no politician ever has difficulty saying we're resourcing the police more. They don't have any problem doing that because it's a publicly explicable thing. You can say, well, we're making your streets safer. But trying to explain why you would resource defense lawyers more, uh, why you would put more money into the court system is more challenging. And I think you need people with a great deal of integrity and respect for uh, our country to, to be willing to do that. So, you know, that's number one. Number two, and I think we're talking about it a little bit more, is our job is really tough emotionally and, and mentally for a lot of different reasons. But the stuff that we deal with, and when I say we, I mean the Crown attorneys, the, the defense lawyers, police officers, it's really hard. It, it's not pleasant. Like it, we're not spending our day in a feel good environment. We're spending our day, you know, it's not like it is on TV. It's, it's stressful. Um, it is awful. It, it, the stuff we're looking at on a daily basis that you're consuming is very difficult um, to, to deal with. It is not easy. And so that has a burden. And I think we're talking a little bit more about you know, the, the stresses and strains on the, the mental health of people who are in this profession. But it, it has a wearing effect. It, it impacts you. How, how can it not? I mean, we're human beings. We're not, again, people watch TV and think, oh, everyone is so flippant and arrogant. It's not. Uh, you know, you are seeing what's happening. You are reading what's happening. You're, you're seeing all of it. And it's difficult. And so a lot of people leave the profession because they're exhausted. It's, it's, a very emotionally exhausting um, profession to be in. Yes. And uh, if uh, just to finish on this point, though, for people who are getting into the profession, uh, because some people also, they wonder if they want to get into criminal law exactly because of this point, because there are some cases pornography cases, uh, the trafficking cases, the human trafficking uh, or murders that, some people don't have the stomach uh, to do, but I mean, it's part of being a criminal defense lawyer, but how, uh, wh what advice would you give to uh, new lawyers who are maybe a little bit intimidated by these types of cases? Well, first of all, I, I, you know, I'm not of the view that you have to do all the cases if you don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. doing them. And the reason is because if you don't feel comfortable, you're not gonna give your, your most objective, neutral, uh, professional service to a client. There's going to be something that is holding you back or interfering with your professional judgment. And that does not help the client. It's always yeah. the client first. That's your obligation in the system. That's what you're, you're required to do ethically. Uh, so, you know, if it is something that you find that you don't want to be dealing with, then don't uh, is my advice because I, I don't think it helps you. And it certainly does not help the client. Uh, but, you know, criminal law, when you come into it, uh, you understand what your role is. You're not coming into it because you love child pornography and you love murder and you love like nobody loves that stuff. So, you know, that's what I always find a little bit odd uh, about the, the conversation around the work that we do, that it's nonsensical. It's absolutely mm -hmm. silly uh, to think that someone thinks, you know what I'd like to do? I, I think murder is awesome. And that's where I want to <laughs> spend my life. So you're coming into it because you believe in the justice system, because you believe people are entitled to a defense. Uh, you believe people uh, shouldn't be uh, undefended against the power of the state. You know that there are wrongful convictions. You know that criminal law can be used in a lot of ways, including politically. And so all of those things are the reasons I think we come into it and we know what our role and our obligation is. And that's the thing as a young lawyer that you are mindful of that that's why you're working so hard you're working so hard because you believe in the system because you believe it's important to have an independent hard-working person speak up and be a voice for the person that is charged just like you need an independent hard-working uh, voice for uh, the state and victims and the crown attorneys you you need all of those voices and so 
you know, we all consider what works best for us personally, where uh, our um, skill set lies, where our empathies lie, where we feel most comfortable. And you have to keep that in mind. Uh, so it's never been a moral challenge for me uh, at all, because I know what my role is. And I, I believe in it. I, I believe in the role of an independent bar. And also, we're not defending the criminal act. I mean, I think that's also a misconception yeah. that some people have about criminal defense oh, lawyers. Absolutely. I, I think that's fair because that's members of the public who don't understand Yeah. Um, and say, well, why would you choose this? I, I understand those questions. I, I try to answer some of those questions when, uh, when they're presented. But as a lawyer, as young lawyers, uh, we have to remember why we're here and how important um, this is, and to remember that historically, you know, when you have uh, uh, moves to to solidify power politically, one of the very first things that that these people do, we've seen it even in the United States, is you get rid of an independent bar, you threaten an independent bar, you get rid of an independent judiciary, you attack the 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 system, the legal system, which always, and this is what we don't, you know, we quickly forget, stands independent and as a place where the government can be challenged. So if you want to consolidate your power, you don't want anywhere that people, members of the public can go to challenge you. You wanna be able to prosecute everybody you wanna prosecute, put everybody you wanna put in jail and, and not have any challenges to your laws. Yeah. That's not our system. So when we remember what we're here to do, um, it's not morally challenging, but I do agree. I mean, it's certainly emotionally exhausting for sure. It's a, it's a tough job and not for everybody. Yes. And uh, Marie, uh, because I am mindful of the time, and I promise you it will be in less than an hour, but I do want to go to something really important, and that's fashion. Oh, because yeah. I know <laughs> it's equally important. For sure. It's very important. Um, right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I know you love fashion. So I'm going to first do. ask you, what is your favorite brand, though? Your, your, oh, my uh, God. I have so many. I mean, it depends yeah. on the day. Maybe. It depends on the season. Yeah. Um, I, I, I spend too much time looking at all of it. I, I love it all, to be honest. So I, I don't think there's well, like a few brands that you like your go-to. There's love, got to be at least two. I love Dior. I, I think they, okay. some seasons really, really lovely. And, um, uh, probably that would be one of my favorites and Valentino. I like very much, okay. but you know, I also like other stuff. It's, uh, a yeah. whole, but if we're talking about like the fantasy stuff, those are, the brands that I love. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I mean, fashion, I know some people, sometimes they make fun of it, but it is important even for our role as a lawyer, because you are the image and the voice of your client and you want to present your client in a good way, right? Like I feel, well, I, yeah, I mean, I think you have to be professional. I, I don't yes. think you, know, you have to be fashionable, yeah. but you be professional. I mean, the fashion part is just for your own entertainment, certainly for mine, but you know, I, as you know, um, first of all, as Middle Eastern part of your culture yeah. you are always dressed up, right? Like you yeah. have to be properly dressed everywhere you yeah. go. So since you're little, you yeah. know you have to properly dress yourself. Like it's a yeah. big deal in our culture, very big deal. And you add to that, you know, that my grandmother was a seamstress. My mother was completely fashion obsessed. My uncle Sammy was completely obsessed. Yeah. With fashion. I mean, we owned a store. We owned a clothing fashion store when mm -hmm. I was growing up. I used to work in it when I was yeah. uh, quite young. Uh, so, it, you know, I do come by it, honestly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a family trait. But it's fun also. I mean, it's something it is, that, yeah. yeah. And, it, uh, yeah. As and I always like, say, ahead. like, I, I always say, you know, to some people, like, being in, uh, being in the court is not the most glamorous place to be, you know, and, and our life is, you, you know, eating a sandwich and having a Tim Hortons coffee. So at least I can dress nicely and feel good about myself I'm doing that so and how do yeah. you do that though like for work because I mean like you mentioned that we have to still dress up in a professional way superior court anyways you can't express uh your fashion sense we're no, always no. from the same way I wish we could have more we could have more colors though in superior court instead of the black yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean how do you still manage to keep your style while being professional I, you know, I honestly, I don't sort of, uh, we know what it looks to be professional and respectable, yeah. respectable to the court and, and obviously representing your client. But beyond that, I mean, I'm not really a person who's too constrained by, uh, I'm not a blue suit and flat shoes or a okay. person, as you know, by nature. So 
you know, I, I wear what I want to wear and the moods change. <laughs> yeah. tell you, it depends, you know, the moods definitely change. Yeah. yeah. And so will we ever see you in a different hair color, Marie? You know, the, the only option is if it were natural, it would be gray. So that that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, my mom's in her 80s and she has yet to to have gray hair. Again, my grandmother was in, she was so cute. She was uh, in an old age home. And uh, the one thing she always insisted on was getting her hair dyed. So again, uh, you know this, it's a culture, a bit of a cultural yeah. thing. Um, so I, I think you're not going to see uh, that color, but you know, my hair has been all sorts of colors from blue to red to all, all sorts of things. Um, so who knows, who knows what I'm in the okay. mood for I can't, I can't tell you. Well, I mean, I haven't seen you in blue or red hair. In a while, yeah. But yeah, maybe it will be time to bring that be, back again. It'd be a bit of blue, yeah, who knows, who knows. Marie, I wanted to ask you, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say, especially to young lawyers who will be watching that? Because, I mean, as you know, a lot of people are very inspired by you, especially new you. female lawyers. They all want to be the new Marie Hennen. So I am sure there are many. Yeah, no, there are. And so, I mean, if you have any advice for these uh, new female defense lawyers, and especially if we don't want them to get discouraged by all the things that we talked about today. Yeah, would be I, I, you know. Uh, my advice for female defense lawyers, male defense lawyers, young lawyers coming into this profession uh, is to focus on always on why you're here, why you're doing this, because uh, when you're you're working the hours that we work, the long hours and, and you're dealing with all the struggles and the failures in court and, and all of the challenges, you have to bring yourself back to a couple of things, why you're there, why you, you value it so much, why you love it so much. Because I, I always say to people, if you do not love, love criminal law, yeah. there's very little to, to recommend it. The lifestyle is lousy. The, the pay rarely meets what you would get on Bay Street. And so uh, you've got to love it. It's got to be so meaningful to you. And then the second thing is that I would say, uh, be patient. Uh, it's a long road and uh, you'll have failures, you'll have successes, but always, always, always be confident in your own ability. You know, all, all the stuff that comes with it, who chooses to report on you, what case comes into your office, those things are not things that I have ever had any control over, that anybody here will ever have any control over. But the one thing you have control over is how good you are in court, how hard you work, how well um, you execute on a case because that's what your colleagues and judges notice and so that's the focus you have to have confidence in yourself um, and that you know what you're doing that you're prepared uh, to do what it takes uh, to to be as as good as you can be at your job and then the rest you know that that's that's a mix of of luck and, and fortune and i don't know what else uh, but you can't control that stuff so Focus on what you can control, which is yourself. But, okay, uh, I, I kind of flied. One last question that I sure. have, though, uh, because you did mention that there are some failures in this. I mean, it's bound to happen. You're not going to win every case, although maybe in sure. your case you've been winning no, uh, almost no. everything. But then, because uh, that does happen when you do lose, it does have an impact on your confidence. And that's when sometimes, I mean, you start thinking, especially when you're starting, uh, if this is really what you want to do, if you were meant to do. So how do you cope with that when you're having like a bad case and things are not going very well? How do you not get discouraged by that? I think that's a sign of a very good lawyer. I mean, there's no case that I've lost that I think, oh, well, who cares? I, yeah. I take it personally. I go through it. I try to figure out what I think I should have done differently or better. I, I do a lot of postmortems and no, I don't get over it. I don't get over it because the consequences are significant and I want to rethink everything I did. And that makes you better. If it, if it just rolls off your back and you don't care, right. then, you know, you're, I'd be concerned about uh, a lawyer that did not care about the results of what they did. So it, it is a blow. It is a blow to your, your not, not only your confidence, but your assessment of your judgment and you have to rethink it and you have to then, go back and you go back at it and you and you learn and you try to make yourself better every single time and you continue to do that unfortunately for the rest of your life every single time you think well i, I should have done this better or i could have done it a bit differently and 
to this day, you know, if we uh, are unsuccessful, we have postmortem meetings where there's a discussion and a consideration of what could I have done differently? What should I have, uh, how should I have approached it? Did we make the right call? You need to do that uh, because what we do matters. It matters more to the person who is uh, your client than it does to your ego, right? So you can get over your ego, but you do have to uh, to consider why you got that result and whether you could have done something differently. So I, I think that's just part of our job is to uh, to take that in and to learn from it. All right, Marie. I don't want to take more of your time because I do want to keep my promise. And I want to thank you very much for doing this interview. It was so much fun chatting thank with you, you. and pleasure. having this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>